Have you ever had a dream where you're standing in front of an orchestra with a flute in your hands, the conductor lifts the baton, and something really beautiful happens? We'll hear about the ins and outs of the flute today on A Note to You. I'm Virginia Eskin. To me, there's something primitive, maybe even primeval, about the sound of the flute. It makes you sort of think of the beginning of man. And even in the midst of a big orchestra, the flute and the sound of it can take you away to another place. It really has a magic about it. Just listen to this. Well, that was Dario Anthony Dwyer playing the flute. And, of course, it's the famous piece by Debussy, Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. And Michael Tilson Thomas was conducting the Boston Symphony. Now, today, our guest is Dario Anthony Dwyer, and we're very fortunate to have her here in person in the studio. She was the former principal flute with the Boston Symphony, and I think she was the first woman to be hired as a principal chair in an East Coast Symphony Orchestra. Well, welcome. You're Thank gonna, you. You're going to tell us how you got started. and Well, um, I got started <clears throat> really long before I was born. My mother played the flute. And uh, she had four children, and she wanted all of us to play the flute, I think. But um, the others went off to other instruments. We all played something. Um, but I stayed with the flute. Did she, she live to see you become the... The oh, great yes. flutist? Oh, that's great. Yes, she came. She was uh, quite surprised, I think, because I didn't tell her anything about even trying out for the orchestra. And uh, she really couldn't understand why I never told her. And I said, well, you know, you have a way of showing up when <laughs> I'm doing something. And and uh, I just, I wasn't sure I was going to get the job anyway. So I thought I'd better just take this audition on the sly, so to speak. And that conductor who auditioned you was the great Charles Munch. Yes. And you were immediately then in the saddle. Uh, you had played flute before in Los Angeles with the, yes. the Philharmonic there. Well, I was appointed as first flute in the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra by Bruno Walter. That was really a very big break for me. And after that summer of playing first flute, I had a, a radio symphony job, and the conductor... Uh, who was the assistant conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and I were quite friends, and I said to him, now you get all the, all the hard pieces you can find with flute solos in them, and because uh, this is my big chance to learn. And I learned a lot that way. Well, let's hear some of your beautiful throbbing Brahms solos in symphonic writing. Let's hear the last movement of the first symphony with the Boston Symphony with Bernard Heiting conducting.
We just heard Dario playing the flute along with a lot of good musicians of the Boston Symphony, conducted by Bernard Heitink. It was the Brahms' first symphony, the last movement. Dario playing flute in an orchestra doesn't usually have the same uh, glitz as being a soloist, but you feel very strongly that it was a wonderful thing to do. Well, I think the composers were really making uh, such a statement about the use of the flute in their symphonies, and and it, it amazed me how much the flute really led out. And no, I wasn't standing in front of the orchestra, but I, I was sitting pretty much in the front row. Well, but, one of the things that makes you so distinctive as a player is that you've had a lot of music written specifically for you. And two of the most prominent composers you've known and worked with would be Walter Piston and Leonard Bernstein. Tell me about your relationship with Dr. Piston. Well, uh, he wrote a sonata for flute and piano, which I played before I came to Boston. And there were various opinions about this work. My opinion was that it was very beautiful, and it was somehow singing. And I played it as a vocal piece. But, but I thought, well, as soon as I get to Boston, I'm certainly going to see Dr. Piston and see if he likes my interpretation and, and <laughs> so forth. So uh, he asked me to come over, and uh, after I played a movement, I think it was, he stopped and he said, I want to tell you something. My name is really Pistone. And I said, oh, Dr. Piston, then maybe I really hit on something, because I feel your slow movements are so vocal. 
<laughs> so that was that was the beginning of our friendship, our very warm friendship. Well, let's hear your playing the first movement of Walter Piston's concerto for flute and orchestra written for you. Yes. And you know, that happened right here. Uh, Michael Tilson Thomas was interviewing Dr. Piston, and he called me up very excited. He said, I don't suppose you just heard me. I was on the air. And I said, no, I didn't. And he said, well, I have something to tell you. I'm writing you a concerto. And I said, wow, how did that happen? And he said, well, you know, I always wanted to. And he said, I just had an interview, and uh, Michael asked me what I was working on. And he said, actually, I just finished a big work, and I was taking a vacation, but you can't say, well, I'm not doing anything. Oh, that's <laughs> and so he cute. Said, so he said, I'm writing a concerto for Dorio. He said, no, I have to do it, and I will do it. <laughs> well, here it is. portion of Walter Piston's Concerto for Flute and Orchestra, played by our guest, Dorio Dwyer, with the London Symphony Orchestra, conducted by James Sedaris. What I loved about that, Dorio, was the incredible consistency you have, whether it's a low B natural, and then the next minute you're flitting up to a high B flat, the etherealness of your sound, but at the same time, it has massive strength. It's like, it reminds me of steel or platinum or something, you know, it seems very pliable, and yet it's strong like cement. Well, thank you. I don't know how you do it. Well, I had, my mother was a terrific example of that because uh, she could do that. And she couldn't teach it, however. 
I had to study with everybody I could find to figure out what she did. Isn't that interesting, to be pliant and at the same time very firm? Yes, yes. Because that's what you really, to me, embody in your sound. There's beautiful, fluffy flute playing. There's um, there are some young women on the stage today who play very virtuosically, mm-hmm. but they don't have your bel canto, that quality. It reminds me of, you know, it's a throbbing, just gorgeous quality. Well, that's partly playing in the orchestra ah. and playing who I with whom I play. Uh, you have to have uh, be very strong in a certain way. You have to know your characteristic of your instrument. It takes lots of experience and thought, but you're you have it every day to work with, and uh, that's what I wanted to do: is to get uh, a lot of different colors and hold my own in the orchestra. Talk to me about the origin of the flute. In early uh, Roman times. The flute had f- whole orchestras of flute playing, and it's interesting that that we are getting flute orchestras back. Oh, really? Do we, yes, just, just flutes, no cellos That's, or basses. No, no, they have bass flutes. Oh, I see, and like a mando bass, mandolin sort of mando yes, orchestra. Yes, a yes, flute. the whole thing are, are flutes, and they used to have this, and uh, then it was banned because people either played the flute and they didn't do any work, and and uh, also was considered very Naughty, very oh, sinful, yeah. and uh, so intoxicating. Yes, it was very <laughs> seductive, and uh, well, so maybe it, was, it really was banned for moral reasons, and uh, sort of like uh, in the uh, you know in in the early part of our century we had prohibition. Well, let's hear another little instance of your beautiful playing. Let's listen to some Bach, two movements from the B minor suite.
Oh, so elegant. Thank you. Two movements from the Bach B minor suite from a live performance. You could hear the coughing. Charles Munch was conducting the Boston Symphony Orchestra in 1952, recorded there in Symphony Hall with our guest Dorio Dwyer. I just found myself thinking of great toshu dancing, the way you were poking those notes so perfectly. Well, it's uh, quite a historic piece for us. Nobody really has that that spirit, as you talked about. You know, it's it's very, it is a very pointed. It that that was historic for me because it was the first season I played oh, with the symphony, yes. and it was about three weeks into the season. Did you have anxiety dreams? <laughs> More than dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Over the last hundred years, we were speaking that composers have really taken up the flute kind of in a favorite way and it puts the flute out in front of the orchestra. Why do you think that happened? Oh, well, it has to do with the times and uh, also with the history of the instrument, too, because uh, the flute could really get around quite a bit, and that was due to an improvement of the fingering system, which was made by uh, a great amateur and composer, amateur composer, I might add, uh, <laughs> Tebold Berm, uh, who was in Germany, and uh, he invented the uh, a, a different fingering system that made it much easier. In fact, it was so good that it was copied as far as possible with adjustments for the oboe, clarinet, and bassoon. So the Berm system of uh, fingering uh, was adopted in the late 19th century and um, on all these instruments. And we all got better. Bigger sound, more fluency. Uh, well, better. I think that there were improvements. There were always very good flutes made, but then they got better too. But then uh, there were re actually many very good flutists in France. Uh, why that should be, I don't know. But the, the composers then, uh, for instance, uh, the Impressionist composers of uh, Debussy and Ravel, really wrote so marvelously for the instrument, whatever they put in there, it was very special for the flute. For instance, we heard Afternoon of the Fawn uh, and, and the other very important French pieces, Daphnis and Chloe. Well, we're going to hear now of quite a departure, a little piece uh, you've recorded by Villa Lobos, the Brazilian composer, called The Jet Whistle. Tell me about that. Well, uh, you know, we talk about jetting around, and earlier, much earlier, the jet referred to whistle on a locomotive. And uh, there weren't even airplanes then, but um, it was the locomotive had this whistle. And so in the piece, you will hear that many of the accompaniments are sort of repetitious. And it's like going on a railroad. Uh, Via Lobos was very uh, interested in trains. Well, this movement, Vivo, is from the jet whistle.
Third movement from Villa Lobos' suite called The Jet Whistle, played by our guest, Dorio Anthony Dwyer, with the Manhattan String Quartet. I like the way that little movement juxtaposed your beautiful lush sound and then the little sort of spiky cello. Um, what do you call that when it goes like a figured bass, an ostinato bass uh -huh. kind of on the bottom? Yes. Today we're having a listen to music for the flute on a note to you, and my guest is Dorio Anthony Dwyer. If you have comments, we'd love to hear them. The address is a note to you, care of WGBH Radio, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. The email address is a note to you at wgbh.org. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. Over your years, Dorio, with the Boston Symphony, you had the opportunity to work with some of the finest musicians of our day. How did you get to work with Leonard Bernstein? Well, actually, uh, I had met him and auditioned for him in New York before I was in Boston. But at this time, um, he had just finished writing Halil, and uh, he came to Tanglewood, and it was performed in Tel Aviv, and it was in a, a memorial to a young man that was killed in the Six-Day War. Now, he happened to play the flute, and he was a very talented, promising flute player. So It had uh, all these aspects yes, to the story. Yes, and, and so he wrote this solo for flute and orchestra. Then when he came to Tanglewood, he was going to play on July 4th, and he was supposed to play the uh, Rhapsody in Blue, I think. But anyway... Then he had plans to record that with the Boston Symphony immediately after the, the concert. But they wanted to record it in Boston. So that meant taking the orchestra all the way back to Boston for a couple of days of recording. And um, in those times, we didn't have many days off. And so the orchestra management said, no, we will record it in September before the season starts. So and, there was mutiny <laughs> yes. in the ranks. Well, not yet, but uh, what happened was that Leonard said, well, that means I have to practice for two more months. <laughs> <laughs> and Not that. He didn't want, <laughs> he didn't want to do that. And so he, he said, therefore, I won't play Rhapsody in Blue, and instead we'll play Halil, and Doria will play this piece. So it happened that way that I gave the American premiere. Good, good, good. <laughs> Well, let's hear a recording of Bernstein's piece with you playing with the London Symphony Orchestra.
a portion of the tone poem Halil, written by Leonard Bernstein, played by our guest Dorio Anthony Dwyer, with the London Symphony Orchestra James Sedaris was conducting. Very haunting piece, I must say. If you have to summon up a young man's life, especially if he's struck down. Yes. You've played a lot of chamber music over the years. What was the attraction for playing chamber music as opposed to playing symphonic music? Oh, Just, well, it's, it's chamber music itself. It's much more intimate, so therefore more expressive. It's really very similar, but there isn't that feeling of competition as much. Well, let's listen to a good example of what you're talking about, Dorio. Variations on a theme of Gluck, but written by a very interesting English composer, Donald Francis Tovey. What uh, made Tovey take a theme by Gluck? Why didn't he use his own theme for his uh, variations? Well, he just liked it, do you think? I, I'm not Mr. Tovey. I have no idea. But um, Tovey, uh, maybe one reason he felt he Maybe he wasn't a melodist because he was doing other things in his life. He was known as a musicologist and a music critic. And everybody uh, who uh, heard about this were very surprised that he wrote. And actually, he composed quite a bit of music. Well, let's hear Variations on a Theme by Gluck, played by our guest, Dorio Anthony Dwyer. Thank you. 
was just a portion of Donald Francis Tovey's Variations on a Theme by Gluck, played with the Manhattan String Quartet by our guest, Dorio Anthony Dwyer. And we're going to end the program with a very exciting piece written by Ellen Swillick. It was written for you to play with, the Boston Symphony. How did that all come to be? Well, when I retired, the Boston Symphony management said they'd like to commission a concerto to be written for me and played at the final concert of my year. So we talked about this person and that person, and uh, I said, oh, well, I would like Lenny to write me a concerto. And they threw up their hands and said, oh, you know, he might not finish it for three years. <laughs> Unreliable. <laughs> Or too busy. And yes, and, and uh, th- that he was notorious for avoiding deadlines. And uh, this was a deadline because it was a year in advance. And uh, so I mentioned a couple other composers, and they said, oh, they're even worse than Lenny if it could be possible about time <laughs> of, of writing. So they suggested several people. And I said, that's fine. You know, nobody's ever mentioned a woman composer. And they said, oh, do you have some ideas? And I said, well, I, I do remember at our uh, Modern Music Week at Tanglewood, I went to all those concerts, and there was something played by Ellen Swillick uh, that I, I admired her the energy she had. And uh, I felt she was going someplace when she wrote her melodies, that sort of thing. So I, I suggested her, and they immediately contacted her, and voila. And she lived in New York, so it was easy for you to work with her, which is a very crucial part of, yes. of a commission. We spent a long time doing that. Uh, when I came to New York with the symphony, we'd always get together, and I would play, I'd even play etudes for her and everything so she could really hear what the flute could do. And I always remember one of the last, she says, well, I'm going now. And we won't we won't meet anymore until this is all done. But just remember one thing. She said, I'll do my very best, but I'm not Schubert. <laughs> well, here's a portion of Ellen Tafe Swillick's flute concerto written for Dorio Anthony Dwyer.
So that was a portion of the Swillick Flute Concerto played by the London Symphony Orchestra with James Sedaris conducting and our guest, Dorio Anthony Dwyer. And it's been very nice, Dorio, that you came to the studio and spoke about your life. For me, you're the strongest woman flutist, I think, who ever lived. What are you busy doing these days? Well, uh, there's still being concertos written for me. I believe it. And I am getting very... Uh, Excited about it. Good. Because it's like a haute couture making you a beautiful dress, to make you a beautiful piece. Our engineer today has been Antonio Oliot Ross. Our producer is Alan McClellan. And I'm Virginia Askin. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. It's produced by Northeastern University in cooperation with WGBH Radio, Boston. <laughs> <laughs>